All right, so this is the first lesson in Unit 3. Unit 3 is all about electrons. Unit 2 was about the atom, but more specifically, that was about the uh, protons and the nucleus and neutrons. Uh, we, didn't, we mentioned electrons, um, but we didn't specifically talk too much about them. So we're going to talk a lot about the electrons in this unit. Okay, so <clears throat> to start off, this diagram right here, should look familiar. This is known as the Bohr diagram. Remember that the Bohr diagram shows the nucleus, but it also states that there are energy levels and the electrons have to stay in certain energy levels. All right, so there are electrons in energy level one, and equals one, N stands for energy level. There are electrons in energy level two, and three and so on now this particular diagram only shows four energy levels but it doesn't really matter how many energy levels are shown okay the idea is electrons exist at each of those levels okay so if electrons exist in specific energy levels where the electrons normally reside like their home is what we refer to as the ground state. All right, the ground state, that's where electrons normally reside. So, whenever an atom absorbs energy of some kind, that energy can be heat, uh, it could be electricity, it could be through a chemical reaction, the electrons then will jump, they jump to a higher state, a higher level, um, and that's called the excited state. Okay, so here, here, this particular electron, this is where it begins, this is its ground state. And then energy is absorbed. This particular electron is absorbing photons. And photons, uh, that's light. So it's absorbing light. And that's giving it more energy. And it jumps to the excited state. Okay, so if it begins at energy level 3, right, if we track this around and say, oh, look, this electron's ground state, where it normally resides, is energy level 3, when it absorbs energy, it now is uh, it boosted right up to here to energy level four. And energy level four is the excited state for this electron. Now, the electron doesn't stay at this high energy for very long. It's got to fall back down to where it normally came from. So because energy is conserved, and remember that means energy gained equals energy lost. Like you can't create energy, you can't destroy energy. Energy is always accounted for. So the same amount of energy is released. And that's released in the form of a photon. A photon, which is essentially uh, a particle of light. But that's a misnomer because light is not really a particle. It's kind of like a non-particle. But we call it particles of light even though it's not really a particle. Not really a particle. Sometimes it's referred to as a packet of light. Okay, so uh, just to recap what's going on here. Anytime an atom absorbs energy of some kind, there's lots of different types of energy. In this case, it's absorbing light energy. Uh, the electrons may absorb that energy and they would be, uh, they jump up because they have too much energy, but then they fall back down to where they came from. And when they fall, they release the energy and that energy is released in the form of light. So light travels in a pattern called a sine wave. Sine waves look like this. 
right? They oscillate over and over and over and over again. So your typical sine wave will have the following characteristics. It will have a crest, which is the top portion. It will have a trough, which is the bottom portion. So these waves, they have crests and troughs, and they repeat. So we kind of have to know what, um, how to count these. And so the way we count them is by counting what's called a wavelength. A wavelength is from here to here. And if we look carefully, okay, a wavelength consists of one crest and one trough. You see, we have half a crest here and half a crest here and a trough right here. So a wavelength is one complete crest, one complete trough. All right, so another term to discuss is amplitude. Amplitude is the distance between the origin and the crest or the origin, origin and the trough. Uh, because the sine wave is repeating, the distance is the same. And how great that value is, how high or how low, is an indication of power, although power is not a term we're going to be uh, dealing with much in this class, that's more of a physics term. Then the next is frequency. Now frequency is really important. It's the number of oscillations per second. And oscillation is a fancy term for a wave. The number of waves per second. Okay, so imagine if we compare two waves one wave looks like this and the, and the amount of time between the start here we'll call this point a and point b the amount of time between point a and point b is one second so if i said all right in one second this wave has two complete crests and two troughs that means in one second, two waves have passed. And to put this in terms of frequency, two waves per second. Now, mathematically, uh, waves, wavelength has a symbol of lambda. Wavelength. And frequency has the symbol of, it looks like a V, it's called nu. And I think I actually mentioned that here. Yeah, here it is. Let's color coordinate this. So la wavelength, uh, you know, wrong color. Let's, let's change that. Wavelength. The symbol is lambda. And wavelength is usually measured in meters, sometimes centimeters, some nanometers, millimeters, whatever, some kind of meter, right? What you should do, though, is you should get used to is the converting to meters. And whatever unit it's given to you in, the first thing you should do is convert it to meters. Okay, so do that. All right. Um, Back to frequency. We used green here for frequency. Oops, that's not a highlighter. The frequency nu is wavelengths per second, or we call them hertz. So waves per second, but the thing is, The word waves is just dropped. And so the unit we used is one over seconds or inverse seconds, right? 
or seconds to the minus one. It's just nobody writes the word waves. It's just one over seconds. That's the unit we use. And so that's how we measure frequency. So if I compared two waves, let's compare that black one to this one. So you see how the green wave, uh, it still spans the same amount of time, so it's still one second. But notice that we have twice as many waves if the green, for the green, there's twice as many green waves than there are black waves. And so the reason is the wave length is shorter for the green one. Shorter waves equals more waves, right? Doesn't that make sense, right? The shorter the wavelength is, the more of them that will pass. And so that means the relationship is inverse. When the length goes down, the number of them that passes or the frequency goes up. So over here, if the wavelength goes down, the frequency goes up. And to put a mathematical number to it, the product of your value for the wavelength times the frequency is equal to this value right here, the speed of light. And that's a constant. So that value, we're going to use that value whenever we have to calculate this, we're using this formula. So three variable equation. And as before, whenever we have an equation, and however many variables there are, that's how many forms of the equation there are. So if I said I need to rearrange this equation to solve for wavelength, I would divide both sides by frequency, and that would give me wavelength. If I said I need to rearrange this equation to solve for frequency, I would divide both sides by wavelength, and that would give me frequency. So because the value of c is a constant and it's always known, this is a pretty simple calculation. You just divide the speed of light by either wavelength or frequency, whichever one you have to get the other. Okay, so let's try the first practice problem and have your calculator handy. The question is saying, uh, what's the wavelength if you have a frequency of 4.22 times 10 to the 20 hertz? All right, so they're asking for wavelength. So I want to take the speed of light divided by frequency to find the wavelength. The speed of light value, 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, divided by the frequency which they are telling me is 4.22 times 10 to the 20 hertz. The unit on hertz, remember, is 1 over seconds. So let's just take a second and calculate that. And here is where uh, scientific notation in your calculator using the exponent key is really helpful. Remember to use the exponent key, you hit second comma. Hold on. Okay, so I get 7.11 times 10 to the negative 13th. And the unit is going to be Hertz. So if we take a closer look as to how we got those units, we were given meters per second over one over seconds. And so really, if you break this apart, it's almost like factoring it apart. It's meters times one over seconds over one over seconds. And so when the 1 over seconds and 1 over seconds part cancels out, that's how you're left uh, with what just meters. Oh, and that means I wrote the wrong unit over here. That's meters. So the unit is just meters, which makes sense because a wavelength has to be some kind of length. All right. Second problem, uh, what is the frequency? And they're giving us a wavelength. Now, notice that they're giving us a wavelength in nanometers, but they give us the conversion. So... If they want to know the frequency, we're going to take the speed of light over the wavelength, right? But 
the units. The speed of light units are meters per second, and the wavelength is meters have the units have to be meters in order to cancel. So that means we need to convert from nanometers into meters first. So 625 nanometers. A meter is 1 times 10 to the ninth or a billion nanometers. All right, so that's going to be 6.25 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Okay, I have my wavelength. So now I can plug my wavelength into the formula or the equation. So the speed of light is, t is 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And the wavelength is 6.25 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Okay, so now we're going to calculate that. Four point eight zero times ten to the fourteenth hertz. So again, picking apart that unit, meters uh, meters per second is meters times one over seconds over over meters. The meters cancels, and you're left with just hertz. Okay, so hopefully this equation, this first equation, makes sense. The speed of light is equal to the product of the wavelength times the frequency, and if you know one, you can find the other. Okay, so once we're okay calculating the uh, frequency or the wavelength of that f photon of light, right? So just to show, remind you again where what's going on, where that's coming from. When this electron fell back down and released that photon of light, what we just did here was we calculated either the wavelength or the frequency of that light. So that's what we're doing right now. Is we're calculating the, the characteristics of that photon that came when an electron fell back down to a ground state in an atom. So, as it turns out, the electron energy is what we call quantized. So what that means is the, it occurs in discrete amounts and these energies can be calculated for if we use a, a multi, like a constant multiplied by a conversion. In this case, the conversion is Planck's constant, which is this value right here. So here is new, right? Here's frequency again. So if you know the frequency, and here we have Planck's constant right here. All you have to do is multiply the frequency by Planck's constant, and that's going to give us the amount of energy that that photon has. So, a photon of light uh, carries, you know, actually, let's do this backwards. I want to do this problem number two first, because it's probably more intuitive. Okay, so, uh, if we were given the wavelength, and they want to know the energy, we can't find the energy directly, but what we can do is we can solve... For the frequency first, and then energy. So let's do that. So to find the frequency, speed of light over the wavelength will give us the frequency. So 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second over the given wavelength, which it's in meters. And remember, if it's not given to you in meters, you must convert it to meters first. OK, so let's calculate its frequency. Okay, 6.42 times 10 to the 14th hertz. So that's the frequency. But really, they wanted the energy. So now that we have the frequency, we can go ahead and multiply the frequency by Planck's constant. So Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds 
And we're going to multiply that by the frequency, which we just calculated, 6.42 times 10 to the 14th hertz. Okay. So the energy is 4.26 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. And that's the joule that's really per photon. Because that was one photon that we calculated uh, the wavelength of. Okay, so we took the wavelength, we found frequency, we found the energy. Okay, so now let's do practice one, practice problem one, which I think we can do now after having done the other one. So in this example, here they're giving us the energy and they want to know the frequency. Okay, no big deal. We use the same equation, but this time, since we're trying to find the frequency, we just rearrange the equation. E divided by H is going to allow us to find the frequency. So, given energy, 3.634 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. And then we divide by 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. Okay, so notice how your joules cancel. And so the unit you're left with is one over seconds, which is hertz, which is what it should be because we're trying to find frequency. So 3.634 times 10 to the negative 19th divided by 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34. Okay, our frequency is 5.48 times 10 to the 14th hertz. All right, part B, what is the wavelength? Okay, so we have the frequency, we can find the wavelength, no problem. Speed of light over frequency will give us the wavelength. So let's just do that. Seven times 10 to the negative seventh meters. Uh, they specifically want this in nanometers, so we need to convert. We'll go one step. So there's a billion nanometers per meter. So multiply 5.47, 10 to the negative seven by 10 to the ninth. That moves the decimal place. And we're gonna have 547 nanometers. Okay, two equations. Both equations will be given to you. You just have to do the moving around and solve for whatever it is that needs to be solved. Your units should make sense, which means the units should be shown to cancel. Right? And that's, that's nothing new. Okay, so the last little bit to talk about then is what we call spectra. And there's three types of spectra that you'll need to know. The first type is what we call continuous spectra. And this is the spectra that you may have learned in middle school. It's all the colors of the rainbow. Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Now, when all of these are present together, when you add them up, it equals what we call white light. So when you look outside at the sun or you look at a light bulb, um, that's regular light is known as white light. All of those colors are there. The second type of spectra is what we call emission spectra. And with emission spectra, the way we do this, the way we, we make emission spectra is, uh, think of like a neon, a neon sign, right? So let's say you got a neon sign. It's got letters. Right, and so it's got hooked up to in a power source and it glows. Okay, so what's really going on in here 
is that in this neon sign, there's actually gas particles. And that gas particles can be various gases. It could be neon itself. It could be argon. It could be krypton. You know, let's just say, let's just go with a neon atom. So the electricity is causing the electrons in the neon atom to absorb energy and jump up. But remember, if anything that jumps up, it has to fall back down. And so this is constantly going on throughout the entire atom. Electrons are jumping up, electrons are jumping down. And every time that happens, every time the electron falls back down, a photon is given off. Right? Every time. So these photons emit, these photons are packets of light. And so depending on what their wavelength is, they will give off a specific color. And so whichever ones, uh, whichever transitions are shown, whatever colors there are, there's going to be specific bright lines. So let me jump over here to this picture to help make this make more sense. Okay, so this first color band here, this is white light. And as you can see, all of the colors represented. You got to start with the red, then you go to your orange, and you go to your yellow, green, blue, and you go violet. The emission spectra here, the second one, notice how there's only a specific number of color lines, right? In this case, you're only seeing, what is that, seven, seven of them, okay? Different elements give off different transitions, and so some elements have more lines than others. Either which way, this is unique, and it can be used as a fingerprint, so it can help us identify elements. So that's there's a big difference between continuous spectra and emission spectra. Continuous spectra is everything. Emission spectra is only specific lines. Okay, so the third type of spectra is what we call absorption spectra. And with absorption spectra, um, imagine we have a light source. A light bulb. All right. And so let's say that we put a, um, a bottle of some kind of chemical in between ourselves and the light bulb and the light bulb. The light, of course, light goes in all directions, right? But the light that goes through, through the liquid, and this is like a colored liquid, okay? So this is like a chemical solution. Doesn't necessarily come out the same. That's because some light is absorbed by, in this case, it's a liquid, but it could be a gas, it could be a solid, right? The point is, the whatever the substance is, whatever the material is, it's absorbing some of the light, which means not all light travels through. Hence the name absorption spectra. So this then, the absorption spectra, that white light, right, that, tra that traveled through, notice how we're missing lines. Well, these missing bands of color are specific wavelengths that were absorbed. Okay, so continuous spectra, emission spectra, absorption spectra. And the last thing to talk about would be, uh, oh, actually, two more things to talk about. Over here, the visible spectrum, let me write this a little neater. Um, you need to know 
that the colors of visible light occur at different wavelengths. And so these wavelengths are in nanometers. So red is generally the 700s. Orange is about 650 nanometers. Yellow is about 600. Green is about 550. Blue is about 500. Indigo is about 450. And violet is about 400. So if I said, what color is light if it's got a wavelength of uh, 610? Well, 610 would be around here. So that would be yellow light. Okay, so we use these benchmarks, Roy G. Biv, okay, to help us identify colors. Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about here is the EM spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetic light. So when we look at the wavelength, the wavelengths vary for light. Light can have a wavelength of 100 meters to 10 to 1 to a tenth to a centimeter to a millimeter and so on. Notice how the wavelength gets smaller and smaller and smaller and look what happens to the frequency. Right? The frequency increases because the waves are shorter. And so that's what you're seeing at the top here. The frequency in hertz is listed at the top. And the wavelength is listed at the bottom. And yes, they are inverse. Now, this middle section here, this is the visible spectrum, right? So this here would be where the Roy G. Biv fits in. But notice there's other waves here that you probably recognize. So there's ultraviolet or UV. X-rays you've heard of. We just talked about gamma rays last unit, right? And we know, what do we know about gamma rays? We know they're really bad for you, right? The high energy will knock off electrons off of atoms and molecules, right? And that causes bad things to happen in the cell. X-rays, you know, you X-rays have their uses, but generally you don't want to be around too many of them because they'll do similar things that gamma rays will, right? Not, not nearly as badly, but still we want to avoid our exposure to X-rays if you break a leg, you can only take so many x-rays per year because the dosage is just, you know, they monitor how much you're exposed to. Ultraviolet, well, you know, ultraviolet, too much sun tanning could possibly lead to skin cancer, right? Because of the ultraviolet rays that you're absorbing. So as the frequency increases, these, the EM, electromagnetic waves become more and more dangerous. Then... Here's visible light, and visible light is not dangerous. But if we, the waves get longer than visible, then we get infrared. Uh, you might have heard of infrared because infrared is the technology used for night vision. Microwaves are longer than those, and these are, you know, these are originally were used for communications, but uh, they also can be used to heat food, uh, specifically because microwaves can shake the oxygen atoms in water, and food contains water, so... When you turn on a microwave, the all the water molecules vibrate to the tune of this, whatever the machine is set at, and that causes them to vibrate, which causes them to get hot, and that's how your food gets warmed up. And then there's radar waves and radio waves. So all of these are the same thing. They are all photons. The difference is what is their wavelength, because their wavelength will dictate their frequency, and the higher the frequency, the more dangerous they are. All right. So that's, here are some examples of, um, this is emission, emission spectroscopy for various elements. Notice how they all have unique lines in specific places. So that's what I mean by they're unique. They're like a fingerprint. Okay. All right, that's enough for today.